again, I want to say a word of appreciation to all the mothers here today. I remember some years ago, I tried to be a mother. <laughs> and uh, it never worked very well. My wife had to be away from home for some months. And then we have three girls. And uh, uh, they were in school, so uh, I had to prepare them for school. And then uh, they're girls, so I had to give them here style <laughs> to, go to, to go to school. And uh, one day, my eldest daughter came home and said, Daddy, teacher asked me today who combed my hair. <laughs> so I said, what did you tell her? She said that I told her Daddy combed my hair. Now, it was quite interesting because there are several hundred children in the school, and she had a lot of students in her class for her to ask her, who comb your hair? <laughs> so I asked her, so what did teacher say? Said teacher didn't say anything. <laughs> so um, I got that to mean that the hair was so well combed <laughs> that teacher had to notice it. <laughs> so after that, you know, so as not to bruise my daughter's self-worth, I decided that I would get help. <laughs> and, uh, but it was a good time we had together. And uh, I tried. <laughs> yeah, but it was, it was not the same. <laughs> because mommy wasn't around. So this morning I want to say, in addition to saying Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers here today, I want to especially say a word of appreciation to Sister Harding for being such a good mother to those girls, so much so that sometimes they don't even remember that daddy exists. <laughs> but I'm not jealous, I'm just, you know. And uh, to all you fathers, who have tried to be mothers, congratulations. Today, I want to speak to you on the subject, the profile of a mother, the profile of a mother. And so I'm going to read for you from the book of Luke, chapter 1. And I begin at verse 28. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. I think that this is beautiful, that the angel of God said to this woman, you have found favor with God. And each one of us, especially ladies today, I want you to Find favor with God. Let us pray. Father, I ask you today to bless these words to our hearts and especially to the mothers here today. Encourage them through the word we pray in Jesus' name. Now, if you had a chance to choose your mother, what would you like her resume to look like? 
What kind of resume would you be looking for? And what would her profile be like? You know, Jesus had the honor of choosing his mother. Did you know that? Oh, yes. Because Jesus knew who his mother would be. If he never knew that, he would be God. So he had a chance to choose his mother. And then he chose Mary. So what about Mary? Why she was chosen? And what about your mother? Why was she chosen? Now, all we know about Mary is found in the Bible. And what we know about her should appeal to us forcibly. It should appeal to our heart, and it should also appeal to our imagination. Now, it is true that there is a lot of attention that is given to Mary. But the child, and not the mother, has become the chief themes of our talk and also of our thoughts. But no woman, and certainly no mother, can talk about the wonderful things that happened at Bethlehem without thinking with tenderness as well as with awe about Mary. So we do not want here to make Mary or to lift Mary higher than Jesus. We don't want to do that. But at the same time, Mary has her place. So, this morning, we are going to be examining some of the spiritual qualities of Mother Mary. And uh, Mary, first of all, I wanted to understand that Mary was bearing the word of God in her heart. Before she bore the Son of God in her womb. So that was the prerequisite for being the carrier of the Son of God. So Mary, let us look at her first quality. What we see here through the scripture is that Mary was a woman of great humility. So the first quality of Mary was that she was a humble woman, a woman of humility. Humility was the grace which made Mary great. Never did she impose herself upon the world. Never did she try to get for herself the least shade of her son's glory. So she did not try to usurp the glory or the authority of her son. She humbled herself. Along with this humility... Where was the quality of godliness? So, with humility, she was a godly woman. She was a what? Godly woman. So, it seemed to me here that those who have done well as mothers, they have to be humble. And they have to be godly. Now, the part that was given to Mary was, was a great part. But yet, 
she performed it with absolute self-assertion, with dignity and obedience. Lowly and obscured, she went through life. Oh yes, bearing her part. You know, as I thought about Mary, can you imagine that you are growing up in your community as a young person? And uh, in your culture where you grew up, it is, it is absolutely required that before you bear a child that you become a wife and then all of a sudden as a young girl you find yourself pregnant not only that but you don't know who the father is because you have never had a sexual relationship now forget about the idea of she thinking that one day she would bear Jesus. There was no such idea. So she must have been confused. She must have been bewildered. But then, the angel of the Lord came to her to comfort her. I want to say to the ladies here today, to the mothers here today, one of the responsibilities of the angels of God is to bring comfort to those who are in distress. And so, you can't be a mother without handling emergencies. You cannot be a good mother without facing difficulties. And so here it is that Mary had... To begin with, her share of challenges and difficulty. But lowly and obscure. Oh yes, she bore these discouragement. And then the angel of the Lord appeared unto her. And announced to her. And said to her, Mary. I have come to tell you that that which you have if, uh, is of the Holy Ghost. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have been more confused. I would have been more confused. But it seemed to me here that Mary had a spark of godliness. And she was humble enough to carry this load. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5, the Bible says... All of you, clothe yourself with humility towards one another. Because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so Mary was a humble woman. Now apart from being humble and godly, she was also submissive. She was submissive. Mary accepted her lot, whatever it was, without complaint or any attempt to have things otherwise. She was willing to give herself over to God, to the Holy Spirit, and the angel came to let her know that that which you have Within you is of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. And so she made sure that she submit her ways, her will, and her life to the molding influence of the Holy Spirit and to the power of the Almighty. Those of you who have war mothers, you know that it is always a challenge to remain composed. Especially when you are, when you are rearing children who, are, who want to have their own way. Or want to make their own decision. And looking back now, and, and the children that you have grown, 
and looking back at their life, the way they live, of course, not everyone is going to be what you want them to be. Not everyone is going to live the way you expect them to live, to be. But looking back over the way you have, you have brought, from where you have brought these children and how you have grown them, could you have done it without submitting to the power of the Almighty God? How were you able to provide for them? When there were times when you never had much money. How were you able to provide for them when the bills were due, this, the, the school fee was due, and you didn't see any way out? It must be that you were willing to submit yourself to the power of the Almighty. So Mary was godly. She was humble. And she was also sub. Submissive. Now, to be submissive does not mean that you are weak. But there comes a time in one's life that we have to submit to higher power. So this was what Mary did. Interestingly, interestingly, Mary was willing to submit herself to her son. Because it never took her very long to discover that this was not an ordinary person. This was not an ordinary son that I have. One of the, and uh, that doesn't mean that she never made mistakes. One of the great mistakes that Mary made while she was growing Jesus, she made a very terrible mistake. But then she never had to pay much for it. But it was a very serious mistake that Mary made. Mary made this mistake. How can you have a 12-year-old boy and you have to travel for three days from your home to go to Jerusalem to the feast of the Passover. And after traveling back home for three days, you discover that your 12-year-old was not with you. Can you imagine that the church takes a trip to Disney World? And, uh, and we have two large buses because we gathered people around. And after the trip is finished, you are coming home and you are, and you, we have, say, three buses on the road, and you are assuming that your son is on one of these buses. And then when you get home, your son is not on any of these buses. That was a terrible mistake that Mary made. That bothers to me. I don't want to be very hard on her. But looking at it, this is clear that Mary was no perfect mother. Because there is no perfect mother. But she was still the mother of Jesus. So Looking back, what would you say was your greatest mistake as a mother? But amid all of this, what part did God play in all of it? And then, I believe that Jesus was... And I'm thinking now that Jesus was a human being. Okay, he was a human being. But I think that he was a little insensitive to his mother. And children are sometimes insensitive to their parents. 
Because after she walked back after three days to find him in the temple, and when she spoke with him, he said, don't you think that I must be about my father's business? There was no remorse in that statement. But then, he's the son of God. So he can speak the way he wants. But from a human point of view, children sometimes are insensitive to the pain of their parents. And uh, I know that there are mothers who weep at nights and cry for their children. I think one of the things that Mary did that helped her very well as she grew Jesus was that she was a praying woman. And she stayed very close to God. And this is one of the things that parents need. Even if you have grown your children already, wherever they are, you still have to pray for them. You still have to pray for them. And you have to pray for their grandchildren. But I want to say to you today, mothers, that the world has been a better place because of you. So Mary was very submissive. Then there is something else I discovered about Mary that she was very prudent. Very prudent. She knew when to talk and she knew when to keep quiet. Mary was almost always more ready to be silent than to speak. This quality must have shielded her many times from making many great serious mistakes. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 19, the Bible says, speaking of, you know, the, the gift of being able to, to be prudent. Luke says, But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. There are some things that you must keep in your heart. Mary has been the object of poverty. She was not a rich woman. She had sorrow. She was a woman of piety and mercy. Suffering is about the only certain thing in human destiny. There is no human being who can go through life without suffering. And you have had your share of suffering as mothers. Then there's another quality that Mary has, and that is fidelity. Faithfulness, the ability to stick to the course without wavering, the ability to go for long hours without being weary or discouraged. Mary stayed with her son throughout his trials and crucifixion. Not only at first, but to the very last. She rose to the task imposed upon her and fulfilled the commandments of God and the commitment that she made. Yes. Not what I wish, but what I ought to do was the rule that she followed. And for those of you who are young mothers, I want to say to you today, that is not what you wish. Because there are many things that you can wish, 
but what you ought to do. That is how you're going to be a good mother. And those of you who are young mothers, I want to say to you this morning that you have taken up a noble task, but it is challenging. It is hard. It is not easy. One of the things that I see around me today is that there are those who have given up their role of being mothers and let their children become the leaders, especially those who are teenagers or adolescents. Now, one person has observed that mothers are more naturally religious than fathers. When I look at the statistics, I kind of frown a bit at it because I thought I was more religious. But probably I am more religious than my wife, but she might be more spiritual than I am. Because anybody can be religious. And we, we should not strive to be religious, but we must be spiritual. Not every religious person is spiritual, but every spiritual person is religious. And mothers are often touched by the emotional appeal of the things of God than men. Men are rough sometimes, very rough. And I myself have discovered that as a father, I have been very rough. Uh, you know, uh, and my wife has been very honest with me. And she said to me, dear, when she see what I'm doing sometime, she said, the Lord knew what he was doing. He give you only girls. But mothers have special qualities that men don't have. You know, I remember when we had our first child, and he was, she was six weeks old, and I had to take her to the, take her for her first shot. So when we got to the clinic, and we were sitting in the waiting room, and uh, the baby's name was called, but my wife was holding the baby. She said to me that I must take the baby inside. So I said, no, dear, you, you take the baby inside. But I noticed that she didn't want to take the baby inside. So I said, all right, I took the baby and I went inside. And uh, the doctor, well, the nurse drew out this long needle and turned up her little bottom and st strike her with the needle. And she cried out. And all I did was just to hold her. And that never really shook me because I knew she had to get the shot. So I brought the baby outside and saw my wife crying outside. She was crying. And then I thought it was a little strange. Because why would you be crying? And all the baby got was a shot that was good for her. But then I discovered that no, fathers think differently from mothers. For to me, that was a normal process. <laughs> I never see anything wrong with that. As a matter of fact, I'm glad the baby was crying. That means she's healthy. But no, my wife was crying. 
And then I started learn from that, little by little, that the way we think as men or as fathers, the women think differently. That is why God made them special. And they have a special appeal to things that we do not have. So who is a mother? Who is a mother? Mothers are teachers and disciplinarians. Mothers are cleaning ladies. They are janitors and gardeners, mowers of lawn, and tillers of the field. Mothers are nurses, doctors, psychologists, chauffeurs, coaches, and counselors. Yes, when your mother asks, do you want a piece of advice? And I'm talking to you now as children. When your mother asks, do you want a piece of advice? It is mere formality. It doesn't matter if you answer yes or no because you're going to get it anyway. Mothers are developers of personalities, molders of vocabularies, and shapers of attitudes. Mothers are soft-spoken, saying, I love you with tears flowing down their cheek. Mothers have the potential to be a child first link to God. A child's first impression of God's love. They are all these things and much more. Think of how often in scripture. God uses mothers as the vehicle of mercy and ministry. Who prompted Jesus to perform his first miracle? Who? It was Jesus. Right there in Cana of Galilee, when the wine ran out and the wedding party was in chaos and the couple was embarrassed. Mary went to Jesus and said that they have no wine. And then she knew that her son was going to do something. So she went around the back and called the attendant and used her index finger and said, whatsoever he says unto you, do it. That's a mother. Always jumping to take charge of things when they are going in the wrong direction. And so Jesus performed his first miracle because his mother involved him. You know, mothers knew know rather how to love and they get encouragement from fathers who are very sensitive so a good mother always wants a sensitive father there was a certain couple and the woman had a very serious accident that caused her to lose one of her eyes. And she was, she was very, very troubled with the situation. And her husband said to her, Dear, why are you so troubled? And she answered, It is not the loss of my eye that troubled me but the thought that you may love me less than you love me now. I love you all the same, says the husband. I love you all the same. Not long after that, he also 
removed one of his eyes and came to his wife and said, Dear, that you may believe that I love you, I have made myself like you. I too now have only one eye. So, we are now the same. You have one eye, I have one eye. But I want you to understand here, men, that the best thing that you can do is not to pluck out your eye. You don't have to do that. But you must be supportive. You must be what? Supportive. Supportive. So, as we say to our mothers today, we love you. We don't have to take out our eyes to do that. But we want to let you know, as men, as husbands, as the fathers of your children, we want to let you know that we appreciate you. We want to let you know that you are special to us. And we want to let you know that as mothers of our children, we would have been worse off without you. There, is, there was a lady by the name of Irma Bob Beck. B-O-B-B-E-C-K. And she has written a lot. And she has written about mothers. Yes. And so she tells us of how God created mothers. She says that on the day God created mothers, he had already worked long over time. And an angel said to him, Lord, you surely are spending a lot of time on this one, rather than creating this mother. The Lord turned and said, have you read the speck of this model? She's supposed to be completely washable but not plastic. She is to have 180 moving parts, all of them replaceable. She is to have a kiss that will heal everything from a broken leg to a broken heart. She is to have a lap that will disappear whenever she stands up. She is to be able to function, oh, and black tea and leftover food. And she is supposed to have six pairs of hands. Six pairs of hands. The angel asks, six pairs of hands? That's impossible. It's not the six pairs of hands that bother me, said the Lord. It is the three pairs of eyes. She is supposed to have one pair that sees through a closed door so that whatever she says, whatever, what are you doing, that whenever she says, what are you doing in there? She already knows what they are doing in there. She has another pair in the back of her head. So she see all things she is not supposed to see, but must see. And then she has one pair right in front that can look at a child that just goffed it. 
and communicate love and understanding without saying a word. That's too much, said the angel. You can't put that much in one model. Why don't you rest for a while and resume your creating tomorrow? No, I can't, said the Lord. I am close to creating someone very much like myself. I've already come up with a model who can heal herself when she's sick. Who can feed a family of six with one pound of hamburger and, and who can persuade a nine-year-old to take a shower. Then the angel looked at the model of motherhood a little more closely and said, She's too soft. Oh, but she is tough, said the Lord. You're, you've been surprised at how much this mother can do. Well, can she think? Asked the angel. Not only can she think, said the Lord, but she can reason and compromise and persuade like nobody else can. Then the angel reached over and touched her cheek. This one has a leak, he said. I told you that you couldn't put that much in one model. That's not a leak, said the Lord. That's tears. What's a tear for? Asked the angel. Well, first of all, a tear is for joy, for sadness, for sorrow, for disappointment, and for pride. You are a genius, said the angel. And the Lord says, oh, but I didn't put, him, put it here. I didn't put it here. It appears as if though when I was creating, it appears a tear. A tear that will flow for a broken heart. A tear that will flow for a disappointed soul. A tear that will flow when someone is glad and someone is sad. Why did Jesus make the tear? He made the tear because that is a sign of the complexity of motherhood. She laughs she cries, but when she cries, it is more powerful than when she laughs. Today, you are still a mother, and I have discovered that this time of the year, that's what the, that's what the sociologists and the psychologists have discovered, that during this time of the year, while we heap praise and accolades on mother, it is the saddest time for some mothers. And they give the reasons. Number one, it is the saddest time because 
of miscarriages. For those who have had miscarriages, to the extent that they were never able to rear a child of their own. For those who have had to go through abortion for some reason or another. For those whose children have been murdered or killed in accident. And the most part of it are the things that brings the most grief to some mothers is when they reflect and the burial of their own children and also the loss of their own mothers. But today, I want to let you know that Mary stood at the foot of the cross when Jesus was in agony. She was there. She saw when they pierced the nails in his hand. Mary was there. She saw when they grabbed that wooden cross and dropped it in the ground and his hands tore and his feet jerked and his neck sloped. Mary was there. And when she looked at her son whom she held in her arm when he was a baby, it must have caused pain. So Jesus, the Son of God, was killed in front of Mary. She must have cried. But then, on Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, which is the Mary of Je the mother of Jesus, went back to the sepulchre. Because if you were a mother and your son was placed in a tomb, well, you're going to go back to anoint the body. That's what they should have been going to do. But when they got there, Jesus was not there. Up from the grave he arose. With a mighty triumph he arose. And that same Jesus brought salvation to Mary. Can you imagine when you get when we go to glory? How, how Mary is going to relate to Jesus? Is she going to see him as her son or as her savior? Both. But more so, her savior. And so the travail of a mother would have been paled in comparison to the joy of living forever. As a mother today, I know it's hard. It's had its joys and it has sorrow. Mary felt both joy and sorrow. And that is the reality of life. But I want to encourage you today that after the sorrow comes joy. Amen. And what you go through today, what you suffer today, remember now that joy comes in the morning. Amen. So my encouragement for you mothers today, do what you have to do. Do it joyfully. Do it lovingly. Remember, 
that when God wanted somebody to represent him well, he made a mother. May God bless you. Happy Mother's Day.